Join me in a look at the ancient civilizations of central Mexico, the Aztec, the Olmec, the Teotihuacan, the Toltec, the Totonac, the Zapotec, and other advanced civilizations. Much of this information is derived from a two-week archaeological tour of central Mexico with lectures and guided site visits with well-known archaeology professor William Saturno. Bill is a Harvard PhD and discoverer of the murals and Maya scripts at San Bartolo in Northeast Guatemala. This video is an attempt to show what we have learned during this fascinating show and tell. Evidence shows that people have lived in central and southern Mexico for more than 3,000 years. Central Mexico is considered to be one of the six cradles of civilization in the entire world. There have been hundreds of small tribal groups or kingdoms, and even today there are 69 recognized languages in Mexico alone, not to mention 56 different ethnic groups. The country is the 13th largest in the world with a population of around 126 million. The landscape varies from its many resort beaches to the mountains, high altitude plains, barren deserts, fertile farmlands, and jungles. Travel from one area of Mexico to another is often difficult because of the rocky terrain and vegetation. Occasionally, before contact with the Spanish in 1519, organized civilizations would arise, uniting many more smaller tribes. The evidence of their large public buildings remains all over the country. This tour focuses on these large civilizations, especially the Aztecs, since they were in power when the Spanish arrived. This means that there is written evidence of what these groups looked like, what they believed, and how they lived. Not so much information is available about the much older cultures, except through the work of archaeologists. The indigenous people of the various tribes shared many common religious ideas, foods, calendars, the base 20 mathematical system, and the city-state political system that had leaders that ruled by divine right. Nearly all of the ruins found today are large public buildings meant to show the grandeur of the rulers and to pay respect to the gods. Nearly all that is left of the original construction is the rock foundation layers. Most of these temples were originally covered with smooth lime plaster and then beautifully painted with colorful designs. Traces of that decoration does remain. The people of Mesoamerica mostly originated from Northwest Asia. They domesticated the three sisters, corn, squash, and beans for their basic food source. Other seasonal foods that originated from this area include tomatoes, bananas, avocados, green peppers, vanilla, pumpkin, and of course, chocolate. Of course, it hasn't always been this way. Thousands of years ago, when populations were small, people were able to survive as hunter-gatherers. When climate changed and or game was no longer available, they often just moved to new areas. When populations grew larger and fertile land was available, plant sources of food were developed to add or to replace the missing game. People began living in one place to take care of the crops that they had planted, necessitating shelter and government to ensure the peace and survival. This led to the rise of city-states and occasionally empires. Some raised their own food while others were craftsmen and they traded for what they needed. Occasionally groups just stole from others using violent means to get food, clothes, weapons, and power. Religion is an important part of Mesoamerican life. They believe in an orderly universe of time and space. 
For the time part, a calendar was developed based on every 20 days instead of our every 30 days. Their math was base 20, not base 10 as is ours in the U.S. They used the calendars to measure time, but also to schedule religious rituals and to predict the future. The Mesoamericans organized physical space according to the active powers in the world, the sun and the moon above, as well as the stars. On Earth, there are the wind, lightning, springs, rivers, and rain. There are powerful animals such as the snakes, eagles, and jaguars. Then there is below the Earth, the life force that is in the plants among them. There is God energy in all these visible things, as well as some that are not, the sky people and those who have died among them. Human sacrifice was an important part of ancient religions in the Americas, as they believed several of the gods required a near constant flow of blood to keep the sun coming up every day, to ensure enough rain for the crops, and to prevent the end of the world. Sometimes thousands of prisoners, young people and children would be killed. A high place in the afterlife was promised and it was considered an honor, even though the victims were usually drugged during an otherwise painful death. In any case, human sacrifice was very common throughout the ancient world until modern religions banned the practice. Another common feature of most Mesoamerican cultures were the ball courts. This Toltec ball court in Tula is one of the best preserved in central Mexico. These are found in most of the sites being excavated from Arizona to Nicaragua. These I-shaped fields were where two teams hit a hard rubber ball, about the size and weight of a small bowling ball. It is theorized that the teams scored points by hitting the ball back and forth with their hips until one team couldn't return it. There are many variations in the size of the ball and how you were allowed to hit the ball. It is sometimes associated with human sacrifice and as a substitute for war. Much of the artwork that survives from the many, many archaeological sites shows the might of their soldiers and the superiority of their gods, not unlike many other statues and artwork celebrating our own leaders, military heroes, and religious icons. We flew into Mexico City to see Tenochtitlan, the site of the Aztec capital. The Aztec, who called themselves the Mexica, built the largest empire and civilization ever in Mesoamerica. The Mexica originated in what is now the U.S. Southwest, or the northwestern part of Mexico. They eventually migrated south, eventually settling in the Lake Texcoco area of what is now Mexico City. They were aggressive foreigners and were not welcome at first. They settled in an inhospitable swamp area around 1300 AD and gradually built it into Tenochtitlan. This is what the area looked like in about 1500, according to paintings by Spanish monks and native artists. Lake Texcoco was created and fed by runoff from the surrounding mountains. They built the city using the Chinampa system, setting posts into plots, then filling the plots with dirt hauled from nearby dry lands. It gradually expanded into a city of an estimated 400,000 people at the time of first Spanish contact. This is all that is left of the very center of Tenochtitlan. Gone are the huge temples with their thousands of blood sacrifices. The Aztec military tactics built this city and they continually expanded by threatening other city-states with death unless they paid tribute of whatever the Aztec needed. The famous skull racks in the city both honored the warriors and scared the other tribes into paying up lest they wind up on those racks. It was lucrative to the Aztec who acquired a lot of stuff, but only under duress. 
Not all tribes complied, which was a major factor when the Spanish came and needed allies to defeat the powerful warriors of the Aztec. The Spanish conquistadors did all they could to dismantle what they considered a horrific pagan culture. They used the rubble from Tenochtitlan to build the National Cathedral and the Zocalo and other buildings. We visited the other major Tenochtitlan temple, Tlatelolcohol, also known as the Plaza of Three Cultures. It is the site of a mass grave dating back to the conquest time in the 1500s. Tlatelolco is just a few miles from the Templo Mayor and served the Aztec as the main commercial center. There was a vast and well-organized market with an estimated 20,000 people coming each day to buy food, hides, handmade cloth, clothing, pots, implements, weapons, furniture, and even slaves. Tlatelolco is also the site of a massacre of hundreds of the university and high school students in 1968, protesting the government treatment of farmers and labor unions in the 10 days before the opening ceremonies of the Mexico City Olympics. Hundreds were killed and thousands were injured. Civilizations came and went throughout Mesoamerican history. The earliest known major civilization were the Olmec in the tropical areas of the Veracruz state near the Gulf of Mexico. They date from 1500 BC and are known for their huge stone heads. Their artwork is one of their hallmarks. The Olmec civilization declined precipitously around 400 BC. These photos were from the National Museum in Jalapa. The Olmec were the first known Mesoamerican civilization to practice ritual bloodletting and the Mesoamerican ball game. Their stylized art and the many types of media characterize Olmec art. The name Olmec comes from an Aztec Nahuatl word for rubber people, as rubber trees are grown in the jungles there. Perhaps Mexico's best known site is Teotihuacan, northeast of Mexico City. Teotihuacan started out as a religious center in the central part of Mexico highlands, growing to perhaps as many as 250,000 people, making it one of the largest cities on earth at the time. The name Teotihuacan means city where people become gods. The priests and warriors ran a multi-ethnic city with distinct districts for the Mixtec, the Nahua, the Zapotec, and Totonac indigenous groups. The Aztec would not arrive for around 600 years, long after Teotihuacan was gone. However, after seeing these magnificent ruins, the Aztec claimed a common ancestry. Teotihuacan covers around 32 square miles, and only a small part of it is excavated. This is an elite residential area near the Avenue of the Dead that has been excavated to show off some of the wall art to be found inside. You can see the original paint uh, and plaster on the original building. Uh, the wood itself is often not preserved, but the, the holes, the beam holes, are preserved in terms of what dimension. This section is called the Patio de los Pilares, near the plaza in front of the Pyramid of the Moon. In a 
nice Antimacon house. Mm -hmm. Now the one thing that's missing from this, like you see these, these wonderful bas-relief sculptures, right. right? Those bas-relief sculptures, which you're looking at the stone, in antiquity were covered in plaster and paint. Oh. So that, that thin coat of plaster, you know, sort of just comes right over the surface so that it still had a three-dimensional quality to the art, um, but was then highlighted uh, in different colored uh, paint. The other thing is, I don't know if you can see some of the inlay still. is at the tops of mountains in the natural world, right? And the way that you descend into the realm of the dead, to the watery place where the dead and the gods of the underworld reside, in the natural world, you descend into caves, right? You descend. Tepantitla is a high-status residential compound with brightly painted original murals of the great goddess of Teotihuacan. Nearby is the new murals museum that shows other murals and exhibits that were found at Teotihuacan. This is the Palacio de Tetlitla, one of many upscale apartment complexes built around Teotihuacan that are being excavated at this time. As Teotihuacan was declining, the Toltec were beginning in Tula, Hidalgo State in Mexico, not very far away. Not much is known about the Toltecs from their own history, but only from the later Aztec, who tended to idolize them and used them to justify their conquering of the central mountain plains of Mexico. Nobody knows what the Toltec called themselves, as the word Toltec is Aztec Nahuatl for craftsman. The origin of the Toltecs is unclear, as they left few records. They apparently were traders and skilled warriors who were reputed to be ferocious and highly trained. They inspired enough awe and respect in their neighbors and enemies to not have to build heavy defenses at Tula. Carvings are found on the monuments to honor warrior classes, such as the coyotes, the jaguars, and eagles. Artists, craftsmen, and farmers were also important Toltec groups.
The Zapotec culture of the Central Valley of Oaxaca in southern Mexico is very old, and Monte Obon is one of the earliest cities in Mesoamerica from around 500 BC. It interacted with Teotihuacan. Mountains separate this area from Central City's Central Plateau. The Zapotec were, and still are, a very diverse group of people who speak at least 60 different language dialects. We visited three sites, including the well-preserved palaces and temples here at Monte Alban, which is atop a mesa-like mountain overlooking many parts of the valley. Little is known about it because it was abandoned about 1,250 years ago. It is very visible in Oaxaca and now a very popular tourist attraction. The site may have been abandoned, but as many as two and a half million people lived in the entire area and are still there in many adjoining valleys. Another Zapotec city-state not far from Oaxaca is the Mexican National Monument at Yagul. It is thought that after Monte Alban was abandoned around 750 AD, that residents relocated to smaller places such as Yagul. It has a ceremonial center as well as residential areas. The third Zapotec site we visited is Mitla, which was still occupied when the Spanish arrived in the 1500s. It lies within the village of San Pablo Vila and is famous for its elaborate and intricate fretwork designs that cover many of the walls and tombs. It is an important religious site and has many underground tombs. We were able to visit one of them. We traveled to the eastern jungles of Veracruz to visit El Tajin, a major Totonac site that was inhabited for 600 years, from 660 to 1200 AD. There are at least 20 ball courts on this one site. El Tajin, the sacred city of the Thunder God, was once one of the largest and most influential centers. The Totonacs were known for their elaborately carved reliefs and friezes. Especially impressive is the Pyramid of the Niches, a masterpiece of Mesoamerican architecture with its 365 symmetrical square niches. The Totonac had a neighborhood in Teotihuacan and have a legend that they were the ones who built it. Interestingly, the Totonacs were also one of several tribes that provided Cortes with troops to help defeat the Aztec in the 1500s. There are around 90,000 Totonac speakers today, and they still perform the ancient flying man ritual of the Danza de los Voladores. This flying pole dance is a UNESCO intangible cultural heritage. The four dancers tie a rope to their ankle, and then they jump off atop a 30-meter pole, flying in circular motion to the ground. It involves flute music and originally was a way to ask the gods to end a drought.
We visited Cantona, a site that may have Olmec roots south of Puebla and Jalapa in eastern Mexico. It was abandoned after 1050 AD. This residential area, walled and fortified, was on a long trading route. Only about 10% of it has been excavated, but it has over 500 cobblestone causeways, 3,000 individual patios, residences, 24 ball courts, and an elaborate temple complex. These guys were mainly farmers and traders and were contemporaries of the Teotihuacan. Another archeological site in Eastern Mexico, settled by the Olmec or the Maya from the coastal areas is Cacaxla. It is known especially for their murals of battle scenes and religious symbols from various contemporary cultures. One of the best things about this tour, beyond the informative lectures by Professor Saturno, is that we stayed at great hotels and had very good food. Highlights included our hotels. Be a part of this, if and we are invited. Okay. You know, but I wish we were explained that. This is the Santo Domingo Cultural Center in Oaxaca. Since Oaxaca is a UNESCO designated city, this museum features many of the artifacts from Zapotec and early colonial times. A special treat for some of us was the Casa Azul in Mexico City, the home of iconic painter Frida Kahlo, the wife of mural painter Diego Rivera. We have featured many of Diego's paintings throughout this video. Frida's father called the couple the elephant and the dove. As Frida was short and petite, Diego was over six feet tall and very overweight. She was also 21 years younger than Diego. Most of her paintings were done from her bed or a wheelchair as she never fully recovered from polio as a child and a bus accident at age 18 that displaced three vertebra in her spine when an iron handrail impaled her pelvis. Her ribs and legs were also broken. She was in pain the rest of her life and it affected most of her artwork. Most of her paintings were self-portraits and explored family and political ideas, as well as death. Mm -hmm. 
Casa Azul was Frida's home. She was born and died here in 1954, age 47. The museum is much like it was in the 1950s.